Hi, this is a reading of <clears throat> the Jesus Prayer, a gift from the fathers <clears throat> by Father David Hester. Um, this is from Conciliar Press, uh, Ben Lomond, California, printed in Canada. Uh, this is from 2001. I believe you can still find this book in the Orthodox bookstores. Um, we're going to go to the first chapter here, um, introduction. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. These few simple words, known as the Jesus Prayer, are of great importance to the Christian East, so much so that they are often called the summation of all Orthodox spirituality. The 19th century writer Bishop Ignatius Branchinino wrote of this prayer, Ex <clears throat> quote, Examine all the Holy Scriptures. You will find the name of the Lord exalted and glorified everywhere in them. Study the writings of the Fathers, and you will see that all of them, without exception, suggest and advise the practice of the Jesus Prayer. Finally, turn to the canonical decrees of the Eastern Orthodox Church, and you will find that the Church has established the recitation of the Jesus Prayer as a substitute for the reading of psalms and prayers in one's own cell or room. End quote. This prayer, used by so many men and women of the Christian East, reflects so well the heart of the Eastern Christian spirituality that its use is recommended for both the beginner and the proficient as the driving force in their life of prayer. <clears throat> In this brief work, the principal area of attention will be how this prayer comes to us from the earliest days of the fathers to our own time. It is hoped that this little prayer which comes to us as a great gift and opportunity will begin to resound within us and we will come to pray it not only often but at every moment of our lives. A word which will appear frequently throughout his, this work with which some readers may be unfamiliar is hesychasm. Hesychasm stems from the Greek word hezekia, which entered into the vocabulary of the Christian spirituality in the 4th century. It has become a technical term to designate the state of inner rest and silence, gained through victory over the passions which allow one to proceed to contemplation. Hesychasm refers to the orthodox spirituality that attains the perfection of the person by union with God through perpetual prayer. Its greatest characteristic is its precise affirmation of the excellence and necessity of Hezekiah quiet to attain this union. Hezekiah, Hezekiah's spirituality emphasizes inner recollection in private, continuous prayer, practiced in solitude and silence. It particularly values the practice of the Jesus Prayer and the many different forms of its development as one of the chief means of attaining both outer and inner quiet. It is in the milieu of the Hezekast that the Jesus Prayer developed from the time of the 4th century desert monks onward, the early centuries. One group within the Eastern Christian Church has, throughout history, continually exerted a great influence on the Christ entire Church, those in the monastic life. From the time of St. Anthony in the 3rd century hermits, Monks and monasteries commanded the reverence and respect of all Christian people and exerted a particularly strong influence on the spirit of Eastern Christianity. The Church adopted the monastic liturgy, their spiritual way, and their type of holiness. In fact, it is from well-respected monastic communities that certain practices and emphasis gradually converged to form the Jesus Prayer as we know it. Two of these factors are of primary importance practice of frequent repetition, uh, repetition of short prayers, and the great respect in which the name of Jesus was held. The early church had received from the sacred scriptures a strong respect for the divine name. There are many references in both testaments to the respect in which God's name was to be held. An Eastern monk writing on the significance of the divine name writes of the, of the Old Testament, quote, if the divine name is invoked upon a country or a person, it belongs henceforth to Yahweh. It becomes strictly his and enters into intimate relations with him. <clears throat> Genesis 48.16, Deuteronomy 28.10, Amos 9.12. verse 
The name abides in the temple. 3 Kings 11 verse 3. The name is a guide in man's life and in his service of God. Micah 4 verse 5. Throughout the Psalms, the divine name appears as a refuge, an auxiliary power, an object of worship. In, in, uh, sorry, that's, that's not a quote. That's just, I'm sorry. I messed up. Anyways, in the New Testament, too, the same significance is given to the name of Jesus, particularly in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. It is above all the, the Acts of the Apostles, which could be called the book of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, the good news is preached. Converts believe, baptism is conferred, cures and other signs are accomplished, lives are risked and given. Among the desert monks themselves, there are many references to the power of the name of Jesus. There are accounts of exorcisms performed by the name of Jesus, and a number of apothegmata sayings of the desert fathers deal with the name of Jesus. But even more significant for the latter growth of the Jesus Prayer was the early development in the desert of monological one-word or short-phrase prayers. The Desert Fathers gave great prominence to the ideal of continual prayer, insisting that the monk must always practice what was termed secret meditation or remembrance of God. To help in this task of perpetual recollection, monks took some short formula which they repeated over and over again. For example, we find, Lord, help, Lord, the Son of God, have mercy upon me, or I have sinned as a man, do thou as God have mercy. In the early church desert period, there was a great variety of these short prayers. It took several centuries before these prayers were combined with the invocation of the name to form the Jesus Prayer. St. Macarius of Egypt and his disciple Evagrius. Among the early teachers of the desert, there are two who had an abiding influence on Orthodox spirituality, especially on the growth of the Jesus Prayer. These are Evagoras upon us, who 346-399, and Pseudo-Macarius, whose writings were thought to be those of St. Macarius, the real St. Macarius of Egypt, 300-390, uh, was Evagoras' master in the desert. The influences of the two, however, were very different. Evagoras applied Neoplatonism, with its emphasis on the mind, to the desert's spirituality, while Pseudomacarius, with a more biblical outlook, emphasized the totality of the person represented in the heart. There are very few of the real Macarius' own works still in existence, However, in these few, he appeared as one of the first teachers of a short prayer which had an essential element in the name of God, Lord. They asked Abba Macarius, how should one pray? The old man answered, there is no need at all to make long discourses. It is enough to stretch out one's hands and say, Lord, as you will and as you know, have mercy. And if the conflict grows fiercer, say, Lord, help me. He knows very well what we need and shows us his mercy. Most of St. Macarius' influence on later spirituality is in fact not really of his, his own, but rather that of an unknown author of the 5th century who wrote the 50 spiritual homilies that came down under the assumed authorship of St. Macarius. In these homilies, Pseudo Macarius strongly emphasizes the biblical union of mind and heart, of body and soul. He shows us that the whole man, body and soul must be reintegrated through asceticism and purification, so as to gain self-control and be able to live in constant awareness of the presence of God. Pseudo-Macarius' teaching is, has its basis in the Incarnation. Prayer is not aimed at freeing the spirit from the impediment of the flesh, since the whole person, body, and soul was created in the image of God. The whole person is called to divine glory. In his 15th homily, Pseudo-Macarius writes, It is like this in Christianity for anyone who tastes the grace of God. Taste and see how sweet the Lord is. Such a taste is this power of the Spirit working to effect full certainty and faith which operates in the heart. His very grace writes in the hearts the laws of the Spirit, for the heart directs and governs all other organs of the body, and when grace pastures the heart, it rules over all the members of the thoughts. For there in the heart the mind abides as well as the, all the thoughts of the soul and all of its hopes. This is how grace penetrates throughout all parts of the body. That's an end quote. 
Through Macarius' understanding of the heart and the union among the body, mind, and soul was to have a great influence in the latter development of the theology of the Jesus Prayer. To better appreciate the significance of Sud Macarius' teaching on the heart, we must compare his understanding to that of the disciple Macar of Macarius, Evagrius Ponticus. Evagrius, too, has had str a strong influence on Eastern Christian spirituality. In fact, down through the centuries, a tenth a tension has existed between the understandings of these two men in Eastern Christian thought. Evagoras was the first intellectual to adopt the life of the Anchorites in the Egyptian desert. He not only took on their ascetic practices in their life of prayer, he also tried to integrate their outlook into the philosophical system inspired by Neoplatonism. Evagoras was a disciple of Origen, and he used the Neoplatonic principle of dualism as the basis for his doctrine of prayer. According to this principle, the spiritual and material worlds were looked upon as completely separate and alien to each other. The spiritual world, the realm of the soul and the mind, was considered to be important, and the material world, the realm of the body and of matter, was considered to be a prison and the enemy of the spiritual. Anything that took, from, took form from the material world was considered to be a hindrance in prayer. This principle is especially seen in two of Evagoras' works, the Praticos and the Chapters on Prayer. The heart of Evagoras' teaching on prayer can be found in the following quotes from his chapters on prayer. 9. Stand resolutely, fully intent on your prayer. Pay no heed to the concerns and thoughts that might arise at the while. Thing not 11. Strive to render your mind deaf and dumb at the time of prayer, and then you will be able to pray. Thing number 66. When you are praying, do not fancy the divinity like some image formed within yourself. Avoid also allowing your mind to be impressed with the seal of some particular shape. So saying number 100, no, sorry, it continues. But rather, free from all matter, draw near to the immaterial being and you will attain to understanding. Saying 110, keep your eyes lowered while you are praying. Deny your flesh and your desires and live according to the mind. End quotes. Evagrius ascends the intellect in prayer and has only a few scattered references to the word and trinity, and no reference to the incarnation, the church, or the sacraments. He conceives of prayer as an immaterial contact of the intellect with God. Evagrius' teaching was posthumously condemned, along with that of Origen, at the Fifth Ecumenical Council in 533. His writings, however, continue to be recopied and disseminated by being attributed to St. Nilos. In fact, Evagoras' teaching continued, in spite of his condemnation, to be very influential. In the 6th century, St. John Climacus, or the latter, while opposing him on certain points of doctrine, called him the messenger of God. St. Maximus, in the same century, criticized Evagoras severely, even while incorporating most of Evagoras' ascetic doctrine into his own work. By far, Evagoras' most enduring contribution was in his formation of expressions and vocabulary to the describe the desert spirituality. His vocabulary continued to be used down through the centuries, and, and gradually there was a marriage between Evagorian and Makarian understandings. Evagoras' spiritual notions were subjected to a Christological corrective, and the Evagorian mind and the Makarian heart were united as the mind and the heart. This is particularly true for the authors of Diatokos of Potiki and John Climacus, who synthesized Evagrius and Macarius so that, as John Meyendorf writes, the intellectual prayer of Evagrius became, in the East, the prayer of the heart, a personal prayer especially, explicitly addressed to the incarnate word, the Jesus prayer, in which the recollection of the name holds essential place. Also, during the 4th century, there are two other references to the primitive Jesus prayer. <clears throat> St. Basil the Great, in the 37th part of his great rule for the monastic life, states that each monk must practice perpetual prayer. St. John Cassian, in his Col Colossians, writes on the spirituality of the desert monks, describes at length his per the perpetual invocation used by monks in the desert. St. Diodacus of Potiki. In the mid-5th century, St. Diodacus, the bishop of Potiki of Epiros, was one of the greatest popularizers of desert spirituality in the Byzantine world. In his 100 chapters on perfection, 
He re recommends purification of the heart by calling to mind the memory of Jesus. In chapter 85, he writes, Grace at first conceals its presence in those who have been baptized, waiting to see which way the soul inclines. But when the whole man has turned toward the Lord, it then reveals to the heart its presence there with a feeling which words cannot express. If then a man begins to make progress in keeping the commandments and call ceaselessly on the Lord Jesus, the fire of God's grace spreads even to the heart's more outward organs of perception, consciously burning up the tares in the field of the soul. End of quote. St. Diodocus speaks of closing the mind and filling it with Christ. Another quote by him. When we have blocked all of its outlets by means of the remembrance of God, the intellect requires of us imperatively some task which will satisfy its need for activity. For the complete prayer fulfillment of its purpose, we should give it nothing but the prayer, Lord Jesus. End of, end of saying. Um, <clears throat> Thus, St. Diodacus is the first writer to refer explicitly to the remembrance of the name of Jesus, even though he does not offer any exact form for the invocation. It is, in fact, some time in the 6th or 7th century that the full text of the Jesus prayer is first found. This is in the life of Abba Philemon, an Egyptian hermit. Philemon was once asked by a younger monk what he should do to keep his mind from being distracted. The elder replied, Keep watch in your heart, and with watchfulness say in your mind with awe and trembling, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me. For this is the advice which the blessed Diodocus gave to beginners. And that was a quote, too, by Philemon. Um, and, and of that, and quote. <clears throat> Later, when his same brother John returned for further instruction, he was told, this is another quote, Without interruption, whether asleep or awake, eating, drinking, or in company, let your heart inwardly and mentally at all times be meditating on the Psalms. At other times, be repeating the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. End quote. <clears throat> Thus, from the 6th century on, this living tradition of the Jesus prayer has continued uninterrupted within the Orthodox Church. Growth at Mount Sinai, St. John Climacus. In 527, Justinian I established at Mount Sinai the famous monastery of St. Catherine, an event and place that was to have great influence on the future of the Jesus prayer and hesychasm. The most outstanding of all the spiritual teachers of Mount Sinai was the monk John, who lived in 470 to 649, an abbot of St. Catherine's Monastery. John was given the name Climacus due to the work that made him famous, the latter, climax in Greek, of divine ascent. The latter is a detailed presentation of monastic spirituality in 30 steps. Its focal point is the invocation of the name of Jesus, St. John frequently uses Evagorean vocabulary, however, he strongly acknowledges the place of body, the body in prayer. In fact, some of his texts can lead one to believe that he had already knew the practice of uniting the Jesus prayer to breathing, a practice adopted by later Hesychast. In the following few texts, we will see that the heart of his teachings on, we will see the heart of his teachings on prayer. Quote, in your prayer, there is no need for high-flown words, for it is the simple, unsophisticated babblings of children that have more often won the heart of the Father in heaven. Try not to talk excessively in your prayer, in case your mind is distracted by the search for words. One word from the publican sufficed to placate God, and a single utterance saved the thief. Talkative prayer frequently distracts the mind and deludes it, whereas brevity, monologia, makes for concentration. This is step 28. Continuing on, quote, Close the door of your cell to your body, the door of your tongue to talk, and the gate within to evil spirits. It is better to live poor and obedient than to be a solitary who has no control over his thoughts. Stillness is worshiping God unceasingly and waiting on him. Let the remembrance of Jesus pre be present with your every breath. Then indeed you will appreciate the value of stillness. In step 27, end quote. St. John does not offer any def definite formula in his recommended use of monologic prayer. However, he does unite this prayer to the constant memory of Jesus' name. In St. John, there is found an anticipation of future hesychist theories, which were developed particularly in the 14th century. 
Following the writings of Climacus, the most important writing to come from Mount Sinai on the use of the Jesus Prayer was on watchfulness and prayer by Pseudo Hezekias. This work was at first erroneously attributed to Saint Hezekias, a mid 5th century priest from Jerusalem. It was written, however, definitely after Climacus, since it quotes St. John's passage, quote, May the name of Jesus be united to your breathing, end quote. This work is probably a compilation from several authors who had some connection to the monastery of Vathos on Sinai. In Seal Hezekias, we find the passage, quote, Truly blessed is the man whose mind and heart are as closely attached to the Jesus prayer and to the ceaseless invocation of his name as to air, as air to the body or flame to the wax. The sun rising over the earth creates the daylight, and the veneration of the holy name of the Lord Jesus shining continually in the mind gives birth to countless intellections radiant as the sun. End quote. This is the first time that the expression prayer of Jesus appeared. It is also the first time that there is such a clear connection to the prayer with breathing, as is seen in another paragraph of the work, where ceaseless breathing Jesus Christ, where ceaselessly breathing Jesus Christ is recommended as a constant daily activity. Saint Maximus the Confessor, living at the same time as Saint John Climacus, although not a member of the Sinai monasteries, was Saint Maximus the Confessor. Another monk who was to exert a great influence on the understanding of the place of the Jesus Prayer in Hesychasm. St. Maximus was part of the line of Eastern Christian mystics following St. Gregory of Nyssa, who sought to express the fundamental realities of Christian spirituality in the framework of Neoplatonic philosophy. Maximus used the principal elements of the mysticism of St. Gregory of Nyssa especially his Christology and his doctrine of deification, the gradual process by which a person is renewed and unified so completely with God that he becomes by grace what God is by nature. St. Maximus describes the deified state as a total participation in Jesus Christ. He writes, quote, The admirable Paul denied his own existence and did not know whether he possessed a life of his own. I live no more, for Christ lives in me. Galatians 2.20 Man, the image of God, becomes God by deification. He rejoices in the full in abandoning all that is his by nature, because the grace of the Spirit triumphs in him, and because manifestly God alone is acting in him. Thus God and those worthy of God possess in all things one and the same energy, or rather this common energy is the energy of God alone, since he communicates himself wholly to those who are wholly worthy. End quote. For St. Maximus, salvation consists in being conformed totally and freely to the divine energy or will. This understanding of the aim of the Christian life as the union of wills was to influence greatly the development of the Hesychast tradition and its valuing of unceasing prayer as the way to accomplish this union. St. Simeon, the New Theologian There are no known understanding texts dating from the 8th and 9th centuries relative to the Jesus prayer, it is known that the prayer existed, that its practice continued, and that it already formed a part of the Byzantine spiritual tradition. Its form, however, was fluid, with the name of Jesus being the most important element. It is in this te te the teaching of St. Simeon the New Theologian, who lived, who was born in 949 and died 1022, a monk of the Studian Monastery and later abbot of Sinai of St. Mamas in Constantinople, that the theology of Hesychasm was further developed. St. Simeon is one of the greatest names in the history of Orthodox spirituality. Unlike most other Byzantine ascetics and mystical writers, he wrote in a style which spoke of his own personal encounter with God. There are two strong emphases in his writings. The primacy of spiritual experience in the reality of Christocentric mysticism. Yaroslav Pelikan, a 20th century historian, writes of St. Simeon's spirituality, quote, The true monk was one whose dedication to Christ enabled him, by divine grace, to acquire a mystical awareness of the divine presence. Or as Simeon said in one of his hymns, Not only had the believers become members of Christ, but Christ had become their member as well. Christ is my hand, and Christ is my foot, and I am the hand of Christ and the foot of Christ. End quote. 
Saint Simeon himself received mystical experiences of Christ as he relates, quote, Though thou didst often thus didst often silently appear to me, hidden so that I could not see thee at all, yet I saw thy lightning flashes and the brightness of thy countenance as aforetime in the waters. Again and again they encompassed me, but I was unable to seize hold of them, so I was mindful of how I had seen thee on high. Thou who art invisible to all beyond thought or comprehension, didst appear to me, and it seemed to me as though thou wast cleansing my mind and increasing its vision, permitting me to see thy glory even more. It was as if thou thyself didst grow and shine yet more brightly. Thou didst seem to me to come forth and shine more brightly, and this grant me to see the outline of thy form beyond shape. At that time thou tookest me out of the world, when I said, O Master, who art thou? Then for the first time thou didst grant me the prodigal to hear thy voice. Thou saidest, I am God who have become man for your sake, because you have sought me with all your soul. Behold, from now on you will be my brother, my fellow heir, and my friend. End quote. Indeed, the, this experience of Simeon is the prime example of the religious experience desired by all Hezekast. In St. Simeon's writings, there is no direct reference to Jesus, the Jesus prayer. It is known, however, that he used monological prayer. St. Simeon's biographer, Nisadis Thethatus, writes of his life, quote, At that time he was filled during prayer with great joy and suffused with burning tears. Not yet initiated in the, such revelations, in his amazement, he would cry without growing weary, Lord, have mercy on me. Finally, much later, when this light gradually withdrew, he found himself again in his body and inside his cell. He felt his heart filled with an indescribable joy, while his mouth cried aloud, as has been said, Lord, have mercy on me. End of quote. It is not clear whether this prayer is directly to Jesus, directed to Jesus or not, but it would seem so since, as was noted in the previous text, the voice that St. Simeon heard in his vision stated, I am the God who became man for love of you. <clears throat> the Flowering on Mount Athos It is the 14th century, the golden age of Mohesychasm, that is the high point in the development of the Jesus Prayer. In fact, over the following five centuries, there were three periods of great intensity in the practice of the prayer. The 14th century in Byzantium, the 18th century in Greece, and the 19th century in Russia. In the 13th and 14th centuries, there are four outstanding figures who greatly influenced the development of the Jesus Prayer. St. Gregory of Sinai, St. Nicephorus the Hesychast, St. Theoleptos, Archbishop of Philadelphia, and above all, St. Gregory Palamas, Archbishop of Thessalonica, St. Thessalonica, Gregory of Sinai. St. Gregory of Sinai, 1255-1346, represents the end of the Sinai phase and the beginning of the Athenite phase in the history of the Jesus Prayer. He was a monk from Sinai who, while living in Crete, learned of the Jesus Prayer from a monk named Arsenius. He later went to Mount Athos, where he found only three monks who were experts in the compl li compl comp contemplative life. St. Gregory instructed the monks there in prayer. From that point on, Athos gave its own particular stamp to the Jesus Prayer, as noted in the Prayer of Jesus. On Athos, the prayer lost its first fluidity, but by degrees, Athos established its fir it firmly in a formula and it, it insisted, oddly enough, on the con concomitant psychophysical technique. In short, the a Athos exhibited greater rigidity. St. Gregory's influence extended far beyond Athos. From 1325 on, the Athenite eremitical monks living outside the protective rampart of the great monasteries were victims of Turkish attacks. So St. Gregory left Athos and finally settled in Peroria on the border of Bulgaria, where he was protected by the Bulgarian Tsar. From St. Gregory's instruction there, Hezekasm spread throughout the Slavic countries, where it reached a high point in the 15th century movement of the Transvolgan Hezekasm, 
of Transvolgan has a chasm under St. Neil Sorsky, 1433-1508. The writings of St. Gregory have always been very popular among Orthodox monks. He was imbued with the precepts of the latter and presented prayer with a deep understanding of the psychology of monks. In his treatise on, contempl on contemplative prayer, life and prayer, he sets down the theological foundations of the mystical life in this way. This is a quote. Even if we have been reborn in the spirit, our faith is dead and inactive. There are two ways of finding the activity energy of the spirit that was received sacramentally in holy baptism. A. By the observance of the commandments and at the price of long efforts, we may achieve in a general way a revelation of this gift. B. It is revealed in a life of obedience to his spiritual father by the methodic and continual calling upon the Lord Jesus, that is, by the remembrance of God. The first way is longer, the second is very short, provided that the soul has learned to dig ground courageously and perseveringly in search of the hidden gold. End of quote. The Jesus prayer is seen as the indispensable aid to this growth in contemplation, in fact, St. Gregory advises that a person pray in this way. One should remain seated and make a profound bow, pronouncing the formula, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, with perseverance. This is done to bring about the union of the mind and heart, which the Hezekast insists is essential for contemplation. St. Nicephorus the Hezekist Another important Athenite monk of the 14th century is St. Nicephorus the Hezekist, C. 1300. St. Gregory Palamas said he was an Italian who converted to Orthodoxy and became a monk on Mount Athos. St. Nicephorus wrote the little treatise on guarding the heart and also the method of holy prayer and attention, which was at first falsely attributed to St. Simeon the New Theologian. In these works, St. Nicephorus unites the ideas from many earlier monastic authors. From St. John Climacus, he takes the idea of linking the name of Jesus to breath, from the spiritual homilies of Pseudomacarius, he takes the understanding of the body, soul, and spirit as a single organism, which sin alone breaks up. From St. Simeon, the new theologian, he uses the idea that Christ came to reestablish unity within a person, and that when one constantly recalls the name of Jesus, the grace of redemption lives within. St. Nicephorus presents these elements as, as a series of spiritual exercises and counsels, in On Guarding the Heart, he presents excerpts from various writers and concludes with a discussion on attention. This conclusion is of great importance because in it, St. Nicephorus points out what he considers to be the heart of hesychasm. He stresses that really to learn prayer or to deal with any spiritual difficulties, a person needs an experienced spiritual father. The spiritual father is at the heart of hesychasm, for he is the only one who can instruct properly. Frequently, the practice details of the Hezekast method are not clearly written out. It is rather assumed that a person will have a knowledgeable teacher to follow. St. Nicephorus, however, does deal with the practical side of Hezekasm. In fact, he concretely, for the first time, the practices of... He, he concreti concretizes, for the first time, the practices of Hezekasm, which are often called psycho -physical me the psychophysical method, at the end of On Guarding the Heart, he writes, quote, That is why we should search for an unerring guide, so that under his instruction we may learn how to deal with the shortcomings and exaggerations suggested to us by the devil whenever we deviate from left or right from the axis of attentiveness. If, however, no guide is to be found, you must renounce worldly attachments, call on God with a contrite spirit and with tears, and do what I tell you. You know that what we breathe is air. When we exhale it, it is for the heart's sake. For the heat is the source of life and warmth for the body. The heart draws towards itself the air inhaled when, it's, when breathing, so that by just charging some of its heat when the air is exhaled, it may remain an even temperature. Seat yourself then, con concentrate your intellect, and lead it into the respiratory passage through which your breath passes into your heart. Put pressure on your intellect and compel it to descend with your inhaled breath into your heart. 
Therefore, brother, train your intellect not to leave your heart quickly, for at first it is strongly is disinclined to remain constrained and circumscribed in this way. But once it becomes accustomed to remaining there, it can no longer bear to be outside the heart. For the kingdom of heaven is within us. Luke 17.21 And when the intellect concentrates its attention on the, in the heart and through prayer, pure prayer searches there for the kingdom of heaven, all external things become abominable and hateful to it. Moreover, when your intellect or noose is firmly established in your heart, it must not remain there silent and idle. It should constantly repeat and meditate on the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, and should never stop doing this. For if the prayer, for this prayer protects the intellect from distraction, renders it impregnable to diabolic attacks, and every day increases its love and desire for God. Banish then all thoughts from this faculty, and you can do this if you want to, and in their place but the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. And compel yourself to repeat this prayer ceaselessly. If you continue to do this for some time, it will assuredly open for you the entrance to your heart in the way we have explained, as we and as we ourselves know from experience. End of quote. <clears throat> St. Nicephorus made very concrete and precise the role that Pseudomacarius had already assigned to the heart in prayer. He viewed the heart as the center of the person. It is around this center that each person exists as an indivisible psychophysical unity. It is in the depths of this unity that a person is to pray the Jesus prayer. In the method there is a, even a clearer description of the psychophysical method. Unfortunately, that description is so clear that later translations of the work replace, replace the passage with a footnote for fear that it would lead the, render, the reader astray unless he, he or she learned it directly from the master. There is, however, a description of this passage in the prayer of Jesus. <clears throat> this is a, another quote. And now here is the central passage of the work. In order to pray, one must close the door of one's cell, place oneself in a quiet state, sit down, press one's chin against the chest, look for toward the middle of the stomach, restrain one's breathing, make a mental effort to find the heart's source, while repeating the epiclesis of Jesus Christ. At the beginning, one experiences only difficulty and obscurity, but soon one notices a kind of light, Henceforth, as soon as an evil thought arises, and even before it appears and takes form, it is expelled and destroyed. That is the end of the quote. Thus, St. Nicephorus closely connects the Jesus prayer to various breathing and posture techniques. These techniques were later to be a source of controversy and were eventually, especially in the 19th century, to be separated from the Jesus prayer as unnecessary for praying the prayer fruitfully. St. Theoleptus of Philadelphia The next important figure in the 14th century is St. Theoleptus, Archbishop of Philadelphia, died 1320. He was a married man and father who, after the death of his wife, entered a monastery on Mount Athos and became a disciple of St. Nicephorus. He is considered to be one of the greatest theoreticians of hesychasm, especially on its psychology. He analyzed the functions of the mind and applied to each of them a specific role in the practice of the Jesus Prayer. St. Theoleptus' analysis, according to the psychology of his day, connects the mind's functions to the Jesus Prayer in this way. The dianoia, the <clears throat> responsive process of lo <coughs> the <clears throat> sorry, the responsive process of logical understanding conceives and repeats incessantly the name of Jesus. The noose, the power of the intellect, intuits the truth directly. The pneuma, the spirit, creates love and sorrow for sin. The functions, those were bullet points, by the way. <laughs> the dianoia, the noose, and the pneuma. The functions of the Jesus prayer is to unite these three foc and focus them totally on the Trinity. St. Theoleptus became one of the chief inspirers of the renewal of hesychasm, introducing into it a strong emphasis on the sacramental and ecclesial aspects of spirituality. 
St. Theoleptus, says a bishop of Philadelphia, was not in a cloister nor in a desert, but rather closely linked to the 14th century and social spiritual reforms in Byzantine society. Throughout his whole career, he sought to encourage an ecclesial community and sacramental spirit. The importance of St. Theoleptus, however, was overshadowed by that of one of his pupils whom he initiated into hesychasm, St. Gregory Palamas, 1296-1359 who became the theologian par excellence of hesychasm. St. Gregory Palamas, <clears throat> Defender of Hesychasm St. Gregory Pal <clears throat> Palamas grew up in the court of Emperor Adronicus Ninicus II Palilogus, his father being a member of the Byzantine Senate. Adronicus was one of the most religious of the late Byzantine rulers, Gregory's father himself was so religious that he prayed even during the Senate meetings. St. Gregory's biographer, in fact, tells us that often, when the emperor would speak to the saint's father in the Senate, he would be praying and not hear him. But the emperor so respected this man that he would not disturb him. When Gregory was 20 years old, he decided to become a monk. Being inspired by contact with eminent monks in Constantinople, particularly St. Theoleptus of Philadelphia, <clears throat> Gregory was so convinced of the value of this vocation that he persuaded his mother, his father had already died, two sisters, two brothers, and a large number of family servants to enter monasteries. St. Gregory lived about ten years at Mount Athos, where he attained a good knowledge of patristic literature and a deep experience of the various problems of the monastic life. He lived there semi-eremitical form of life. He lived a semi-eremitical <clears throat> eremitical form of life in which a few monks would gather around a spiritual master. They lived, prayed, and practiced asceticism together, and on Saturdays and Sundays went to the monast monastic community on which they were dependent to participate in the liturgy and celebrate the mysteries. This type of life greatly influenced Gregory and helped him to realize the danger of exaggerated hesychasm, which often had a contempt for liturgical life. Around 1226, St. Gregory left on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land in Mount Sinai. He got as far as Thessalonica, where he stayed for several years. There he joined a group of people, a kind of spiritual circle with members from various social levels, that sought to spread a practice of the Jesus Prayer outside the cloisters. They saw the prayer as a preeminent means of making the grace of baptism real and efficacious. About 1331, St. Gregory returned to Athos, where he decided to live in the hermitage of St. Sabas, still keeping the balance among personal spiritual life, prayer, and liturgy. After 1338, however, his life was greatly changed when he became involved in the controversy created by Barlaam of Calab Calab Calabria over hesychasm. From the time that Barlaam, a Calabrian monk, arrived in Constantinople in 1338 until the final synodal condemnation of Barlaam's followers in 1351, St. Gregory took an active part in the controversy that struck at the very roots of hesychasm. During this period, St. Gregory's support, his supporters and opponents were involved in the four church synods and a six-year civil war. St. Gregory was first exonerated by a church council, then three years later imprisoned and excommunicated as a heretic. Finally, he was vindicated and consecrated as Archbishop of Thessalonica. The central point at issue in all this conflict was the difference between two profoundly different understandings of the spiritual life. Barlaam had been greatly influenced by the philosophies of Neoplatonism and Nominalism, the belief that abstract ideas are mere names with no real content and by the spirituality of Pseudo-Dionysius. He viewed humanity dualistically, seeing the spiritual life as a freeing from the body, and only the intellect is capable of contemplating God. His understanding was based on two assumptions. One, that all knowledge, including knowledge of God, is derived from the perception of sense experience, a postulate of Aristotle. And two, that God is beyond sense experience and therefore unknowable a postulate of Neoplatonic philosophy. Barlaam believed that all knowledge of God must be indirect, passing always through objects or beings perceptible to the senses. 
Therefore, he believed that mystical knowledge can have only an apparent reality, existing in name only, but having no reality in itself. Barlaam was shocked by the Hezekiah's claims that the human body could participate in prayer, that it could feel the action of the divine grace, and that the saints have a real vision of God. He said that the Hezekiah's were omphalocycoi, those with the soul and the navel, and accused them of a heresy of Messalianism. The Messalians were a sect that originated in the 4th century. They believed that as a result of original sin, every person had a soul divided into a spiritual angelic part and a material, incurably demoniac part, and that the only possible means for salvation was perpetual prayer with the aim of eliminating all passion and desire. Those who became perfect in this way claim to experience in a knowing and feeling way the grace of God and to see God himself. It is in opposition to these accusations of Barlaam that St. Gregory wrote the Hagarite Tome, which was signed in 1340 to 1341 by the abbots and monks of Mount Athos, and the triads for the defense of holy, the holy Hezekiah's Gregory gave an answer to each of Barlaam's accusations, and in doing so, presented a unified theology of hesychasm. First of all, St. Gregory defended the close link that exists among all the components of a human being. Quote, but what pain or pleasure or movement is not a common activity of both soul, body and soul? There are indeed blessed passions and common activities of the body and soul which far from nailing the spirit to the flesh, serve to draw the flesh to a dignity close to that of the spirit, and persuade it to tend towards what is above. For just as the divinity of the word of God incarnate is common to the soul and body, since he has deified the flesh through the mediation of the soul to make it also accomplish the works of God, so similarly in, sp in spiritual man the grace of the spirit transmitted to the body through the soul, grants to the body also the experience of things divine, and allows it the same blessed experience as the soul undergoes. When the soul pursues this blessed activity, it deifies the body also, which, being no longer driven by corporeal and material passions, returns to itself and rejects all contact with evil things. Indeed, it inspires its own sanctification and inalienable divinization, as the miracle-working relics of the saints clearly demonstrate. End of quote. <clears throat> it was with this understanding of the unity that should be found in each human that Palamas attacked the accusation of Messalianism, which holds that evil always coexists with good in the soul. He demonstrates that this is not true by noting that a person is totally renewed by baptism, eliminating all evil, and that one only need to live without live out this renewal, because baptism does not remove human passions and human desires. St. Gregory then goes on to show how these things are good, not to be eliminated, but rather integrated with the Spirit. Quote, Thus one must offer to God the passionate part of the soul, alive and active, <clears throat> that it may be a living sacrifice. How can this be done? Our eyes must acquire a gentle glance, attractive to others, and conveying the mercy from on high. Similarly, our ears must be attentive to the divine instructions. Our tongues, our hands, and feet must likewise be at the service of the divine will. Is not such a practice of the commandments of God a common activity of body and soul? And how can such activity darken and blind the soul? End of quote. Thus, there is a common activity of the body and soul, and it is from this common activity that one prays and strives for ever deeper communion with God. For Gregory, the Jesus prayer is the positive means to unite body and soul in prayer and to have constant remembrance of God. Quote, we supplicate with this continual supplication not to convince God, for he acts always spontaneously, not to draw him to us, for he is everywhere, but to lift ourselves up towards him. End quote. Because of this need for the giving for giving full attention and prayer, Saint Gregory defended the psychophysical techniques connected to the Jesus prayer. He did not see these techniques of breathing and posture as simply mechanical ways of obtaining peace, but rather as a 
practical way for beginners to avoid distraction and the wanderings of the mind. St. Gregory knew that it was of great importance to avoid distractions and to become as internally unified as possible during prayer. For as the Hesychus knew, those who preserved in prayer could receive divine illumination. This was not simply an intellectual experience, but an illumination of the whole person. The Hesychus believed that this illumination was connected to Christ's transfiguration on Mount Tabor. Quote, <clears throat> How should he not illuminate those who commune worthily with the divine ray of his body, which is within us, lightening our souls as he illumined the very bodies of the disciples on Mount Tabor? For on the day of the transfiguration, that body, source of the light of grace, was not yet united with our bodies. It illuminated from outside those who worthily approached it and sent the illumination into the soul by the intermediary of the physical eyes. But now, since it is mingled with us and exists in, it, in us, it illuminates the soul from within. End quote. It is moreover through the Hesychast use of the Jesus prayer that this illumination occurs. Quote, this light as, at present shines in part as a pledge for those who through impassibility have passed beyond all that is condemned, and through pure and immaterial prayer have passed beyond all that is pure. But on the last day it will deify in a manifest fashion the sons of the resurrection, who will rejoice in eternity and in glory and communion with him who has endowed our nature with a glory and splendor that is divine. End of quote. St. Gregory professed the reality of this union of, and of this illumination brought about through prayer. This position was opposed by Barlaam, who stated that illu the illumination was symbolic only, as an appearance created by God. Here, as Yaroslav Pelikan explains, Gregory was faced with a paradox that is at the heart of Orthodox belief. Quote, the God of Christian devotion was simultaneously absolute and related, incomprehensible in its nat his nature, and yet comprehended by the saints who participated in his nature. He was absolute by nature, related by grace. End quote. To explain how divine illumination was indeed a true union with God, Gregory made a distinction that became basic to Orthodox theology, the distinction between God's essence and his energies. <clears throat> Quote, Since one can participate in God, and since the superessential essence of God is absolutely above participation, there exists something between the essence that cannot be participated in, and those who participate... <clears throat> to make participation in God possible for them. Thus, he makes himself present to all things by his manifestations and by his creative and providential energies. In one word, we must seek a God in whom we can participate in one way or another, so that by participating, each of us, as in the manner proper to each, and by the analogy of participation, may receive being, life, and deification. End quote. St. Gregory's defense was so well received by the Orthodox Church that he was called the light of orthodoxy, teacher of the church, its confirmation, ideal of monks, and invisible champion of theologians, invincible champion of theologians, preacher of grace, <clears throat> Troparian of Gregory of Palamas. He was canonized a mere nine years after his death, and the second Sunday of Lent was dedicated to his honor. His theology of the Jesus Prayer and Hesychasm has influenced the Church's understanding of Hesychasm down to our own day. St. Gregory's synthesis did not have a chronologically continuous influence, however, for after 1453, the development of the Byzantine cultural and intellectual tradition was interrupted by the Turkish conquest of Byzantium. It was not until the late 18th century that Hesychasm was to have a revival. A Modern Revival The Hesychastic tradition did not die out in the East. Mount Athos remained the chief center of Orthodox religious life, and its libraries provided the essential protistic texts for the very few scholars of the time. In Russia, the practice of the Jesus Prayer continued to grow gradually. St. Neil Sorsky in the 15th century, various monasteries in the 16th century, 
and St. Demetria Rostov in the 17th century all advocated the use of the Jesus Prayer. At the end of the 18th century, Mount Athos once again became the center for an intense diffusion of the Jesus Prayer. This was due to the work of St. Macarius of Corinth, 1731-1805, and St. Nicodemus the Hagarite, 1748-1809. Both of these men are of great importance in the revival of hesychasm. The Age of the Philokalia during the 17th century, 17th and 18th centuries, the Christian East was in a particularly deplorable condition. A number of her theologians had been trained only in Western scholastic theology and had little access to the traditional writings of the past. There were only a few isolated individuals of learning who were in a position to revive the Eastern theological spiritual tradition. In 17 82. Nicodemus, a monk of Mount Athos, in collaboration with Macarius, the bishop of Corinth, published at Venice an anthology of patristic text by authors from the 4th and 15th centuries, which was called the Philokalia of Niptic Saints. The Philokalia, the Greek meaning love of beauty, deals chiefly with the theory and practice of prayer, especially the Jesus Prayer. This book became the source for a revival of hesychasm in the 19th century in both Greece and Russia, where the book was translated into both Slavonic and Russian. The Philokalia was to have a special influence in Russia. In 1793, the renowned elder St. Paisius Velishkovsky, 1722-1794, a Ukrainian, published at St. Petersburg a Slavonic edition of the Philokalia called the Dobrod to love the love of the good. St. Paisios was a monk of Mount Athos, where he founded a monastery in Ru Russian monastery. He later went to Romania and became abbot of the monastery of ne Niemetz. Through his guidance, this monastery became a center for the translation of the Greek fathers into Slavonic. There, St. Paisios placed great emphasis on the continual practice of the Jesus Prayer. And it was through his influence that many monasteries were introduced to hesychasm. In the Dobrotolobie, St. Paisius, who had already translated various Greek texts into Slavonic, did not merely translate the text printed in the Greek Philokalia, but added other original texts as well. His completed work was widely circulated in Russia and was used by monks and lay people alike. This is seen, for example, in the way of a pilgrim, where the pilgrim, a layman, buys a copy for two rubles. 19th century Russia 19th century Russia became a great center for the practice of the Jesus Prayer. This renewal had at its heart a certain significant personalities, particularly the line of Staretsi elders at Optino, and the solitary personality of the great saint of the contemporary Christian church, Russian church, St. Seraphim of Sarov. Optino was a 16th century hermitage near the little town of Kolesk, Kozelsk, uh, in central Russia. At the end of the 18th century, when the hermitage was nearly abandoned, the Ashramandrite Macarius. The Metropolitan of Moscow asked a disciple of St. Paisius, the Archimandrite Macarius, <clears throat> to send a small group of monks to reestablish the hermitage. They did this in 1821, and soon the elders of Optino acquired unique fame throughout all Russia. These elders were sought after, the, by, sought after by the people from all levels of society, all walks of life. <clears throat> In the elders' eyes, the senator, the poor peasant, the student, all seemed equally suffering and in the need of spiritual medicine. Prominent literary figures such as Gogol, Dostoevsky, Kamyakov, Soloviev, and Leo Tolstoy came seeking direction. The Optino Staritsi exercised a prophetic ministry, and to all who came, they sought the value of the Jesus Prayer. The other bright lights of the 19th century hesychasm was St. Seraphim of Sarov, 1759-1833. He entered the monastery of Sarov at the age of 19, spending his first 15 years in community life and then 30 years in seclusion. He used his years of seclusion as his training for the office of elder. 
and in 1825 opened the doors of his cell to all who would come to him. St. Seraphim constantly prayed to Jesus' prayer, and in the tradition of St. Simeon the New Theologian and St. Gregory of Palamas, he was granted the vision of the divine and uncreated light. In Seraphim's case, the divine light actually took the form, the visible form, outwardly transforming his body. The Hezekash tradition manifested itself in Russia in the 19th century on many different cultural levels and in many very different forms. Among laity and clergy alike, St. Ignatius Branchininov, 1807-1867, Bishop of Kostroma, besides writing on the value of the Jesus Prayer for all people, published a more complete Slavonic edition of the Dobro Toilevie and St. Theophan the Recluse, 1815-1894. Another important teacher of the Jesus Prayer prepared a greatly expanded translation of the Philokalia in five volumes, not in Slavonic, but in the Russian vernacular. In addition to these learned works on the Jesus Prayer, there appeared in the sa at the same time a very a simple story of a wanderer called The Sincere Tales of a Pilgrim to His Spiritual Father, or The Way of a Pilgrim. It is in the story of a simple Russian peasant who becomes a pilgrim, a wanderer traveling back and forth across Russia. He is in search of a way to pray without ceasing and discovers this in the Jesus Prayer. He buys a copy of the Dob Dobrotolubye, and frequently consults it to explain both the Jesus prayer and itself and the importance of this prayer for the whole of the Christian life. The story takes place sometime between the Crimean War, 1855, and the abolition of Russian serfdom, 1861. Its first edition appeared in 1884 at Kazan and stated that the work was printed according to a manuscript obtained from a monk of Mount Athos. <clears throat> The second part was published in 1911 in Moscow. There is some controversy over whether these are actual autobiographical tales or simply spiritual novels. Whichever they are, these works have had tremendous impact in popularizing the practice of the Jesus Prayer. The Pilgrim recommends the prayer to all Christians in the words of St. Gregory Palamas, quote, not only should we ourselves, in accordance with God's will, pray unceasingly in the name of Jesus Christ, we are bound to reveal it and to teach it to others, to everyone in general, religious and secular, learned and simple, men, women, and children, and to inspire them all to pray without ceasing, end quote. The 20th Century West In the present Western world, the Jesus Prayer is becoming more widely known and practiced as it has been for centuries in the Christian East. This is due in part to the immigration of Orthodox Christians to the West, especially Russian and other Slavic immigrants. There have also been new additions and translations made of the Philokalia and other, old, and other older writings on the Jesus Prayer. In English, a partial but uncritical translation of the Russian Dobro Tolovia in two volumes by E. Kadlobovsky and G. Palmer was first published in 1951 and 1954. The same translators also produced a collection of various texts on the Jesus Prayer compiled by Charitan of Valamo in Finland in the first half of this century. This contains principally texts by Theophan the Recluse and Ignatius Branchaninov and is titled in English, The Art of Prayer. In 1930, R.M. French published an English translation of the Russian work The Way of the Pilgrim, which has been issued in several su successive editions. And other translations of The Way of the Pilgrim have also been published more recently. Since 17, 1979, Bishop Callistos Ware, G.E.H. Palmer, and Philip Sherrard have issued four of the five promised volumes of the complete translation of the Philokalia from the Greek. This promises to be a boon for greater understandings of the Jesus Prayer among English-speaking Orthodox Christians. Finally, many collections of sayings from the Philokalia have been published, and other new works about the Jesus Prayer have been written. Receiving the Spirit the Jesus Prayer is a gift which comes to us from our fathers throughout the centuries, but like any gift, it must be opened and used to be really appreciated. 
It is a great, a rich part of our Eastern Christian heritage and has led to the sanctification and illumination of many, opening them more to the, fully to the active and energetic presence of the Holy Spirit. This gift is given not only to the church as a whole, but to you personally under the guidance of your spiritual father, to be used, to be prayed, to become part of your life. Under the guidance of your spiritual father, you will learn how you should pray the Jesus prayer. The prayer may be used at assigned times in the day, or it may be used in times of quiet, particularly when you are involved in some activity that frees you from talk and provides a, a time of quiet. This may be some repetitive activity in the home, or it may be when you are driving, particularly when the traffic is not causing inner turmoil. The prayer can fill your heart when you are being kept on hold on a telephone or when you are waiting in some office for an appointment. The prayer may be prayed when you wake up in the morning or before going to bed. You may even want to wake up in the night and pray it in the quiet of dark silence. The only way that this can happen is for you to take to heart the words of our fathers and begin gradually to repeat the words to yourself, to let the prayer become a part of you like the beating of your heart or the breath of your lungs. Then you can share in this gift and thus attain a more constant recollection of God and openness to his presence. To whom be glory, honor, and praise, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. Thus ends the reading.